Hello, it's Scott Manley here. In my previous video on Apollo hardware, which was never designed to go to space, I missed some really big things. And I mean things that are as big as the mighty Saturn V itself. But unlike the Saturn V, they didn't move particularly fast. They did actually move, but they probably had the lowest top speed of anything in the Apollo program. I am, of course, talking about the twin crawler transporters and the mobile launch platforms. For Mercury and Gemini, the spacecraft and rockets were integrated on the pad itself, but for Apollo, the size and complexity of the Saturn rockets meant that they were integrated inside a dedicated vehicle assembly building, and then they had to be moved to the launch pad. Now, many people mentally conflate the crawler transporters and the mobile launch platform. So let's make this clear. The Saturn V or Saturn I would sit on top of the mobile launch platform, which would, of course, be integrated and assembled inside the vehicle assembly building. Then the crawler transporter would drive in underneath it and jack it up and then drive that slowly to the launch pad. Now, when you're moving an object that's over 100 meters tall and costs billions of dollars, you understandably do this with great care. The 16 traction motors, powered by up to 4 megawatts of electricity, allow a top speed of about 1 mile per hour. But it's not just rolling very carefully down the track, it's also compensating for any gradients or any slopes. In particular, as it rises up towards the launch pad, there's a 1 in 20 grade, which entails jacking up one end of the crawler to ensure that the mobile launch platform and the launch vehicle on top of it remain exactly level and vertical. The true crawler transporters were supplied by the Marion Power Shovel Company, which uh, no longer exists anymore, but they built, you know, giant steam shovels and other excavators. Interestingly, they're not the largest uh, ground vehicles in the world, but they are the largest that can move under their own power. The other ones need independent external power supplies. And while this uh, uses electrical motors, that power comes from a pair of large diesel motors on, this, uh, on the platform. It carries like 5,000 gallons of fuel and it needs about 125 gallons per mile or almost 300 per kilometer. There's also a secondary power system that runs the jacking and the steering, and that is a pair of 750 kilowatt generators, again, fueled by diesel. All in all, it's about 40 meters long, 35 meters wide, 8 meters tall when it's fully jacked, and weighs about 2,700 tons, but that's actually less than the mobile launch platform it's carrying. There were three of these mobile launcher platforms built for the Apollo program. In addition to the base with the large vent for the rockets to expel the exhaust through, they included a 120 meter service tower which would have to be plumbed in once they reached the launch pad. And the whole thing would weigh about uh, 3,700 tons, with about, you know, just under 300 tons of rocket when the Saturn V was moved, because of course you would move it without filling it up with fuel. Now, the launcher platforms all had slightly different histories because some of them were shifted to different projects at different times. There's also some weird naming. Mobile Launcher 1 became Mobile Launcher Platform 3. Mobile Launcher 1 launched Apollo 11, seen here moving up the gradient to the launch site. It was later modified to be the launch platform for the Saturn 1B, which meant that it launched all the crews to Skylab and to the Apollo Soyuz test project. Now, the interesting thing here is that they essentially kept the regular Saturn V launch tower, but they added what was called a milk stool to lift the rest of the rocket up. The whole point here being that you would have the same umbilicals coming out to the Apollo capsule and service module at the top, and the crew would use the same facilities, and they didn't have to rewire or replumb everything. Meanwhile, Mobile Launcher 3, which was the third one to be built, was the first one to be converted to space shuttle use, so ML3 became MLP1. For conversion to shuttle use, they removed the service tower from the platform and created a new static service tower structure. They also needed to add a pair of flame vents for the solid rocket boosters on the side. And because the space shuttle was so much shorter, the crew cabin and uh, actually the operational vehicle was so close to the business end of the rocket, let's say, they realized that the sound of the rocket motors could seriously damage the orbiter. So that's when they added the water suppression system to the, sp to the launcher platform. So these launcher platforms are actually serious pieces of engineering. They're not just, you know, flat trays on which you put a rocket. No, they have important systems that are uh, essential to the launch of the rocket and to the safety of the vehicle. 
Eventually, all three of the mobile launch platforms would be converted over to shuttle use and they would be used, of course, for 30 years in that role. Towards the end of the shuttle program, Mobile Launcher Platform 1 would be converted over to the Constellation program, uh, which you know, for Ares was pretty simple because it was just a single shuttle solid rocket booster, so they just stuck that over one of the flame vents with some new clamps and everything. This launched from Pad 39B, and the tower was pretty much a shuttle tower with a few conversions. The last shuttle mission that I'd flown off of that was a STS-116 in 2006, although it had had a shuttle placed on it in launch configuration for uh, the Space Shuttle um, you know, Hubble servicing mission. That would have been STS-400, ready to go in the event that there was a problem with STS-125 so that they could rescue the crew. And since the end of the shuttle program, none of the launcher platforms have been used. Now, MLP-3 has been acquired by Orbital ATK, now known as Northrop Grumman, for their Omega rocket, which is always a hard one to say because of their capitalization. They also acquired one of the crawler transporters, and they've upgraded that for their new vehicle. For SLS, they've built a completely new launch platform, so that won't use any of the heritage hardware, which means the other two launch platforms are essentially sitting unused at this time. Of course, Launchpad 39A was acquired by SpaceX, and it's been used to launch Falcon Heavy earlier this year. So the launcher platforms have essentially reached the end of their life, but the crawlers, they will continue on. They're more than 50 years old, but they still have a bright future ahead of them. In fact, they've been declared to be national historic places. So they're kind of protected by the weight of history. I mean, the literal weight of history that they carried across the space center. Between them, apparently they've covered a distance equivalent of driving coast to coast. Over 3,000 miles in the hundreds of trips these things have done up and down the, the pads. And they're only going to add to this tally over the coming years. I'm Scott Manley. Fly safe. <laughs>